often we talk about and emphasize the need for a careful evaluation and management of hyponatremia, especially if it's chronic. But often we tend to consider that it may not cause too much harm. We'll be discussing about a case which is not an unusual scenario, a common scenario of long-standing hypopenetrism. About tonicity and osmolality, these are two important terms. So osmolality means the number of osmoles which are present in the body. They include the sodium, glucose and urea. Now, the difference between osmolality and tonicity is that basically sodium and glucose cannot really cross the cell membrane. For sodium to cross, there is already a sodium potassium ATPase. For glucose, you will need insulin. While urea can freely cross. So they do not, urea does not contribute to the tonicity of the plasma. So the major determinant of tonicity is sodium and glucose. While if you talk about glucose, the levels are usually normal. So in the absence of hyperglycemia, sodium is the major determinant of our body tone. Now in conditions like hyponatremia or in scenarios in which you have an AVP excess and we discussed that any scenario in which you have got chronic hyponatremia, you will have an excess of arginine resopressin. In those scenarios, you will have a decreased tonicity of the blood. So the brain cells will basically have a swelling. So they will go into an edematous phase and that causes all the features, cerebral edema, headache, irritability, seizures and other problems. Now to counter that, of course, body does have a mechanism in the form of uh, idiogenic osmos, which are basically extruded. And through that, we are able to save all these problems to happen. There is an adjustment which happens. If there is a rapid rise, however, in the serum sodium, this adjustment becomes maladjustment and that may cause a problem. And we have been hearing about this since medical school, the term which was earlier known as central pontine myelinolysis. And now we call it more appropriately the osmotic disequilibrium syndrome. So your whole cells will basically, which are swollen, then become normal, will suddenly shrink. So you will have a lot of lysis of these cells and that causes this myelinolysis. So we'll talk about this is the fundamental aspect which we'll discuss as to how this happened in this case and how we could have prevented, how we could have improved in terms of outcome in that regards. Now, all of you can go and have a look at our website, learning.growsociety.in, which has got a lot of resources related to pediatric endocrinology courses, including fellowship and diploma programs. We routinely run multiple programs in the form of a postgraduate lecture series, grand rounds, their publications, as well as the mobile application. So today, we are going to discuss about a very, very interesting case. Dr. Dhwani, who is our fellow, will be discussing about how this case presented and what it looked like a normal scenario and how things changed. Then we'll discuss about what went wrong. And uh, Dr. Manoj will talk about uh, the overall uh, reasons that could that went wrong and how we could have picked it up at an early stage. Then we have got Dr. Santosh, who is visiting us from Trivendram, who will be talking about uh, how imaging or other diagnostic measures can help it out. Then we will have a discussion as to what are the measures which could have prevented and how we could have treated in this case by Dr. Vibha. And finally, we'll bring everything together to see how this case management could have been better from that perspective. We had Mrs. M, who was a 40-year-old female, who presented to us with loss of appetite for 20 days, lethargy weakness more since the last 20 days. On inquiring further, we got this history of stillbirth at 22 years of age with history of secondary amenorrhea since. There was history of decreased interest in activity, lethargy, poor sleep quality for the last 20 years ever since she had this stillbirth. So I think that's a very, very important uh, history that you elicited there that at 20 years of age, she had a stillbirth and after that she had secondary amenorrhea. Now, one question which will really help you out reach a final diagnosis is, uh, what would you ask at this point, which will tell you that this is really the diagnosis you're looking at? First, what diagnosis are you looking at and what single answer will give you a final uh, diagnosis there? So if she had lactation failure, Yes. In yes, the immediate or postpartum hemorrhage, if they give a classical history of having bled a lot, yes, then yes. that will really clinch the diagnosis. So this is clearly what you think. This is a Sheehan syndrome classical yes. presentation. Yes. A, a patient who actually had a delayed uh, uh, overall problems in terms of the postnatal period. And the key question, as you said, would be to ask whether there was a lactation yes. failure in that scenario. So now you have all these features are suggestive of a classical low level of cortisol deficiency. So let's continue from there. 
Yes, so all of her symptoms were attributed to clinical depression and she was somehow started on antidepressants, which she had been taking for the last six months with no significant benefit in symptoms. For these complaints, she had also visited our OPD about 10 days back. Because the symptoms were non-specific, she uh, was advised some blood tests which showed microcytic hypogromic anemia with thrombocytopenia. Her rest of the investigations were predominantly normal. She was sent on some oral supplements. However, as symptoms persisted, she reported to the emergency room 10 days later. So who was the primary, uh, like which physician did she go into which speciality in the beginning? She went to the cardiology department. Okay, so because of this lethargy, weakness, they went to the cardiology department. Now, again, uh, they have done basic workup, which shows anemia and thrombocytopenia. They have done a TSH as well. What do you think is the thing which you would have done better at that point of time? It is always necessary to look at the free T4 level in the context of TSH level. So just doing a TSH, definitely again, second message coming up here that if you just do a TSH, you may miss a lot of problems in that. And the other big message, what did what was missed here was the serum electrolytes. So routinely, if you have somebody who is lethargic, weakness, you should look for electrolytes as well. Yeah, please carry on. At presentation to ER, her heart rate was on the lower side at 64 per minute. Respiratory rate was 18 per minute. She had cold peripheries and BP of 70 by 60. She presented to us in a confused state with slurred speech. However, her sensorium was E4M5, M6V5, and pupils were two millimeters bilaterally equal reactive to light. She had slightly brisk DTRs with plant, mute planters and blood sugar on the lower side at 66 milligram per deciliter. So there are two big messages that you're giving. There is bradycardia, which is there, and there is hypoglycemia. So hypoglycemia and bradycardia, what would you think of? Hypocortisolism is somewhere. So multi, yeah, so hypocortisolism means multiple pituitary hormone deficiency because yes. you have a thyroid probably affected. And of course, we, we know the diagnosis, so we are more biased. But if you have somebody who has got hypoglycemia with all that presentation and who has bradycardia, we are thinking clearly of an MPHD. Like, this. yeah, carry on. So this was the initial lab investigation when she presented to the ER. So again, we had a hemoglobin of 10.5, sodium of 100 and a potassium of 2.9. Rest of the investigations were essentially normal. Again, only TSH was done at ER, which was in the normal range. She, she had a slightly elevated SGOT level. But the most important or most worrisome thing that I find in the initial lab is her sodium of 100 against a potassium of 2.95 here. So I think this is a very, very starking report. Now, we normally say when you have hyponatremia, sodium and potassium usually go the opposite way around. So if you have hyponatremia, you will have hyperkalemia. If you have hypernatremia or high normal sodium, potassium will go down. What are the conditions which cause hyponatremia with hypokalemia, Dhwani? So adrenal insufficiency is something that will cause hyponatremia with hypokalemia. Adrenal insufficiency in the sense, so if you have primary adrenal insufficiency, we expect to be hyponatremia and hyperkalemia. That will be salt wasting. So generally what we say is that when you have both low, you are losing. So you're losing either from the tubules, diuretic use, or you have a gastrointestinal loss. Now, now the question is that if you are attributing it to adrenal insufficiency, is it central versus peripheral? What do you think based upon this sodium report? Central, definitely. Central, definitely, because the potassium is normal. Now, the extent of sodium reduction is very, very remarkable. So I think that's something which is another thing to really consider because as we discussed it, when we compared three classical scenarios, if we say isolated leukocorticoid deficiency, versus isolated mineralocorticoid deficiency versus a combined defect, which one of these has a maximum effect in terms of sodium levels? Which one of them, the sodium is the lowest? Uh, the combined one usually. Yeah. Because 100 is too low. That is something which I would be a bit too. I would. I have seen hundreds predominantly in adrenal insufficiency in CH, that sort of a scenario. So this 100 was extraordinarily low. The second thing is that potassium is also low. So normally they have a normal potassium, but of course, if somebody is not eating well, somebody is malnourished, you may have some level of hyponatremia, hypokalemia, which may happen. Can you think of any other thing you have already mentioned in your history that could have affected her sodium levels to be that low? Um, 
besides the cortisol deficiency. There is, of course, hypothyroidism also. So that also contributes to Be deficiency. Okay. But this 100, anything else, you gave a history. So that the she was on some antidepressants. Now, we know yeah. that many of these antidepressants do cause SIADH. Like SIADH, that. yes. Now, if you already have cortisol deficiency, if you already have hypothyroidism, on top of that, there is a there is an antidepressant which is further increasing ABAP. Of course, the sodium can be explained. So this very severe hyponatremia is unusual. Typical sodium that you will see in ACTH deficiency will be like 120, maximum 115. I have not seen anything below that. But this 100 is a very, very remarkable, but may have been given antidepressant, which could have affected. Sometimes diuretics are given along with that. So you have to be careful about all that drug history becomes important. So now you have got an individual who has got 20 year old history, a long standing disease. Suddenly, the patient comes to you with a sodium of 100. Now, what do you need to understand here is that this patient has been living with this condition for 20 years. It's not that, that she is in a life or death situation. That is what is very, very important to understand. So don't be too aggressive. Now, remember, this patient was admitted under cardiology. So had they been admitted under us, we would have been more cautious in terms of rise, but they would have seen 100 and they become a bit that something needs to be done immediately. But they haven't thought that for 20 years, the patient was normal and why suddenly we have to worry so much about that. Carry forward. So let us look at the approach to hyponatremia. When you have a patient with hyponatremia, the first thing to question is, is it true hyponatremia? Hyperlipidemia, hyperglycemia, and hyperproteinemia. All these three conditions are associated with pseudo-hyponatremia. So the first step is excluding these three. The next thing to um, ascertain is whether hyponatremia is due to excess fluid or sodium loss. So once we know it is true hyponatremia, we need to know whether it is because of an excess fluid or sodium loss. In a status of free water excess, patient will usually be U or hypovolemic, whereas those with sodium loss are usually hypovolemic. Uric acid is low in free water excess and high in sodium loss. Similarly, hematocrit is low in free water excess and high in sodium loss. Urine sodium is low in free water excess and high in more than 25 in sodium loss. So clinically, was she volumic or hypovolemic or hypervolemic? Because volume is the most important thing to look at in hyponatremia. What do you think clinically she was? At presentation, she had good pulses, although her BP initially was recorded as 70 by 60. But subsequently, after giving a single bolus, she had remained in a volumic state despite so having was, this hypo. pretty much volumic. So she was not really hypovolemic. So all the insufficiency part, sodium loss part is lost. Now, when you say volumia, actually, if you measure their blood volume, you will find them to be subtle hypervolemia. Now, whenever your volume goes up, what will happen then? Which hormone will get triggered? Uh, aldosterone. No, 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 volume is up. A yeah, AVP. ANP, acetylnitrotic peptide. So basically, the heart will say my volume is up. I'll push yeah. the sodium out. So that also will further contribute to hyponatremia. So you get the point? In that yes. scenario, your fluid volume, you have more amount of free water in the body. That free water increases relative hypervolemia and that relative hypervolemia triggers ANP that causes sodium loss and you become euvolemic. So when you are saying SIADH or hypothyroidism or ACTH deficiency as euvolemic, they are truly hypervolemic, which have compensated into euvolemic in that scenario. So I think this was very clear and this patient had a mild anemia. So there was no hemoconcentration definitely. So you're talking about mostly a euvolemic hyponatremia. Next please. So, uh, after, after we've seen the fluid status, if it is hypovolemic, we need to rule out congestive heart failure, chronic liver disease, or nephrotic syndrome. In patients with euvolemia, the most important thing is to see free T4 levels and cortisol levels. If these are normal, then it, we're looking at a patient with SIADH. So one big message is that whenever the uh, intensive care specialists see hyponatremia and patient is not having hyperkalemia, if you volumic, they label it as SIADH. SIADH is a diagnosis of exclusion. SIADH basically means you have got dilute blood and concentrated urine, opposite of DI, dilute blood, concentrated urine with a normal renal 
thyroid and adrenal functions and no history of uptake of diabetics. So all these are confounding factors. So clearly we are out here. Fluid status is euvolemic. You need to do a thyroid profile and a cortisol before you go ahead. Any further, and we have mentioned FT4. That is again a method that this looks like a central scenario. So please go ahead. And in hypovolemic patients, one needs to look at the urine sodium. It is If it is more than 30, if it is less than 30, then we're looking at GI losses. If it is more than 30, then we need to look at the serum potassium level, which if low, we're looking at gibulopathy or diuretic use. And if it is high, we're looking at RAST effect. So we went on to the further investigations and we found that the serum cortisol at 8 a.m. was definitely low. TSH was normal in the background of a low T4 level and LH, FSH were again in the lower for postmenopausal age. So now what, when should you do this cortisol level? Should you do it in the morning? Uh, because we want to document a low level, um, we would like to do it at 8 a.m. Okay. Like we are expecting a low value. So Suppose somebody has come to you at 10 a.m., you will say I'll check it at next 8 a.m.? No, we can... See, Do this it. patient is hyponatremic. So if yes. you have hyponatremia, if you have shock, if you have hypoglycemia, already the ACTH is very high. So yes. you don't need to actually wait till 8 a.m. So this is all the cardiology workup that they have done. We would have said immediately get a cortisol level, get the report in an hour, start hydrocon because we know the diagnosis very, very clearly. So you don't need to wait till 8 a.m. That's a big message. Otherwise, you will be wasting a lot of time. In that perspective. So if there is shock, if there is hyponatremia, if there is hypovolemia, if you have got hyponatremia, you should get a cortisol level immediately and that will be fine. Now this 88, uh, Dr. Manoj, what do you think? This 88 is uh, low, but how low is it? Well, the normal level is 130. So how much should it be? Should, should you find it to be normal? Yes, so at least it should be 500, 550. So this 83 is 88 is very, very low. And what about the thyroid? Clearly, FT4 is pretty low and TSH is less than 20. So this is a classical case of central hypothyroidism. Now, the one point which Dhani has very nicely pointed out is that LH FSH was normal. Now, this is a lady who was not having any periods. So not having any hormonal development in LH FSH is normal is inappropriately low. So this is classically a multiple predatory hormone deficiency. Please go ahead. So in our database, we have a 42-year-old female presenting with secondary amenorrhea after a stillbirth with progressive lethargy since then. On examination, in a predominantly euvolemic state with subtle features of raised intracranial pressure and on investigation showing hypoglycemia, hyponatremia, hypokalemia with central hypothyroidism, cortisol deficiency and low LHFSH. So we pretty much have the picture. This is hypopituitarism, secondary to Sheehan syndrome. So now just before you go ahead, now how would you classify the severity of hyponatremia? Is it acute, severe, acute, moderate, or this is chronic hyponatremia, how will you classify? This is definitely um, chronic hyponatremia. Of, and definitely anything which is beyond 48 hours, we call it chronic. And here the history is so long. So we, this is of course chronic. And if you don't know that history duration, you assume it to be chronic. I think that's the key message when we are starting treatment again becomes important. Please go ahead. So management of hyponatremia based on symptoms, it could be acute severe where uh, the sodium level is usually less than 120. Here you give 3 to 5 ml per kg, 3% saline bolus until symptomatic and, it, and you target uh, a rise in serum sodium of not more than 12 millimoles per liter per day. Acute moderate is uh, sodium between 120 to 130. In this condition, you avoid bolus and you target a rise in sodium of 6 to 9 millimoles per liter per day. And then comes the chronic variety where no acute treatment is needed and you uh, target a rise in serum sodium of not more than 6 millimoles per liter per day. So this looks like the chronic state. But if you have subtle features of CNS involvement, like you were saying, breast reflexes, raised these DTRs, you may consider a low dose 3% saline in that category of chronic as well. But again, low dose, not like a high dose. Now, what actually happened from the cardiology perspective? What did they do? Yeah. And while it is important to uh, 
target a rise in serum sodium, you must always even treat the underlying etiology in these cases. Yeah. So what happened in the index case was for hypokalemia, she was her ECG was normal and she was started on potassium supplement. For hypotension, she received an initial bolus, following which she remained u u volemic and was uh, well otherwise. On the hyponatremia front, she was given three percent saline bolus followed by infusion along with aldactone. So what do you think? How do you uh, assess this? So of course she was given three percent bolus which we may consider okay, but 3% infusion clearly is a problematic issue. How much sodium increases with every 1 ml per uh, kg per 1 ml per hour of sodium infusion, 3% saline infusion? So 1 ml per kg per hour of infusion, how much sodium will increase by that? I'm not aware of Roughly that. Roughly 1 millimoles. So she was, I think, on 50 or 25, uh, how much she was on per hour? 25 ml per hour. 25 ml per hour. So she was like 0.5 millimoles per uh, ml per kg per hour. That would have rose by at least 12 in a day. So that was going to in a very, very wrong trajectory. We don't want it to go beyond 6 or 8. Now, aldectone. Now, what would aldectone do? Vibha. Basically. Yeah. Vibha, what will aldectone do? No, it antagonizes what? It is against what? It's a minocorticoid receptor antagonist. So your glucocorticoid is already not there. And then you are also blocking the minocorticoid, not the RAS, minocorticoid receptor. So your glucocorticoid is already not there. If you're going to block your minocorticoid, you're going to cause hyperkalemia and you're going to worsen your hyponatremia. So probably, uh, this is a bit preposterous to say, but probably aldectone did not allow the sodium to rise that much as it would have risen had they not given aldectone. So it might have been pulling it down. So it was in a, so both are inappropriate, but this could have balanced it out because this could have not allowed sodium to go up that quickly. But that definitely is no physiological basis of either of those treatments. Yes, Dhani. So what happened was with this treatment, serum sodium rose rapidly from 100 at presentation to 122 within 36 hours of hospital stay. It was at 36 hours of hospital stay that finally an endocrine call was given when 3% saline and aldectone were finally stopped and the patient was started on injection hydrocortisone. So by the time that, yeah, this is a very good graph. You can continue. Yeah. So this, as you see, the serum sodium had risen from 100 to a very rapid rise of 122 at 36 hours of hospital stay. And why associated with this rise in serum sodium, we found the patient to have a clinical worsening in form of meaningless muttering, a start of choreoathetide movement, worsening of slurring of speech. She was unable to sit up straight and was constantly rocking in her bed. Uh, there were intermittent episodes of vacant stare with drooling of saliva from the angle of mouth. I think that's very important to remember and understand that many of these patients have been so sick for such a long time, nobody knows what their normal state is. Some people say they are like this. Ye Churu se. So this is this each signs you have to be very, very careful. So when we saw this patient at 36 hours, already the sodium was 122 to 124. We said, okay, no further rise at this point of time. And we were looking for all those things. There were some subtle features, but by next day morning, I think probably another 24 hours passed when all this night sleep abnormalities, continuously fidgetiness, abnormal movement and subtle signs started to creep up. So this is something which... If we had picked up even earlier, that would have been better. But again, they are very, very subtle and often difficult to pick up. In which the sodium was very low to begin with. And then subsequently, there is a sudden rise. And what we are seeing probably around 36, 60 hours, that there are certain signs which are happening. Now, first of all, we need to know what these signs are and why are they caused. So we will... A lot about the clinical feature and how to diagnose the ODS. Let's move on to the management and the prevention part. It is always better to prevent the uh, established from, uh, prevent the occurrence of the ODS uh, rather than treating the established ODS because the prevention is always better than the cure. But now the question is when and how to prevent the ODS. So this is the normal pattern of the sodium rise that we commonly see if the uh, sodium hyponatremia is rapidly corrected. And the same pattern was observed in our patient also. She came with a 
sodium of 100 and after 48 hours it rises up to the 126 so the question arises could we really prevent it could we really prevent ods the answer is yes we can really prevent ods we can prevent it really from the beginning by following the proactive strategy the proactive strategy is really recommended in the presence of some risk factors and the risk factors are when the initial sodium is less than 105, when there is a hypokalemia, when there is a malnourished patient, and when there is a history, when there is a chronic hyponatremia, and all the risk factors were present in our patient. So now, if we miss this chance, is there any other option that we can further prevent the occurrence of ODS? Yes, we can prevent it even after the 24 hours of rise in sodium by following the reactive strategy. Even after the 24 hours, if the sodium has increased greater than 8 milligrams per hour in 24 hours, we can still have the chance to prevent the ODS by following this strategy. I will discuss each strategy later on. Now, if we have missed this proactive strategy and this reactive strategy time period, then what can we do? Do we still have the chance? Yes, we can still treat and prevent the ODS. We can follow the rescue strategy. So we are already at this stage. Yeah. The sodium is 124. 124. And we are already missed before. So as we were saying, eight. So six is I ideal, mean, but up to eight, eight is okay. So here in 36 hours, we already risen by around uh, 15 to 16 per day. So okay. Yes, sir. Right. So we are now looking at rescue, rescue strategy for proactive. proactive. So this is very important. Right. But if your steel sodium is very low, it is chronic, there mm. is hyponatremia, there is malnourished, you have yeah. to be doubly cautious doubly and be very, very slow in terms of price. That's a proactive one. Yeah. So rescue strategy is basically for the established ODS. And when the sodium is rising greater than 16 milliequivalent per hour in 48 hours, that was present in our patient. So let's see what the proactive strategy is. It is basically a primary prevention and it is mostly helpful in the reversible causes when the hyponatremia is due to the, uh, due, is when the causes are due to the uh, drugs causing SIDH, when there is a use of uh, thiazide drugs and when they are suddenly withdrawn, they causes the hyponatremia. And the other good thing which happened in this case was that hydrocortisone was not started. started. If yes, had, they had already started hydrocortisone made the diagnosis at the right time, it would have really bummed up. That would have been a big disaster. Yes, sir. And as Manoj was saying, that probably these patients are better managed in an outpatient basis than an huh. inpatient. Yeah. Because if you see 100 or 3 of 100, you become scared in the inpatient. But outpatient, you start hydrocortisone. So the good part was that it was delayed. They had given 3%, but yes, they had sir. not given hydrocard. And they had given uh, uh, basically spironolactone, which was bringing the sodium further down. Yes. And in the presence of risk factors also. So ideally in our patient, we should go for the proactive strategy. If we cautiously manage the patient which who has the risk factors like malnutrition, hyperkalemia, sodium less than 105, we can prevent the ODS right from the beginning. And how do we do it? We administer the desmopressin either IV or subcuteness, one to two milli microgram every six to eight hourly. But uh, here in our patient, we we prefer 0.1 microgram orally because it has to be given 12 hourly. And so I think this is a very, very many people will get confused. That we yes, have already have hyponatremia. Why are you giving AV? So this is in a way you are putting a break. Your yes, car sir. is accelerating, but you already have a brake so that it doesn't have an uncontrolled. Yes, sir. That sort of a thing is important here. Along with the slow infusion of 3% of hypotonic saline with 15 to 30 ml. Oh, sorry, it's not yes. visible. Now, there is a study showing that the neurological sequelae after the treatment of severe hyponatremia does not depend on the uh, age, sex, alcoholism, and the initial presenting symptoms. And they really depend on the uh, rate of the correction in the 24 hours and the 48 hours. And the risk factors have already been discussed. And this is a chronic hyponatremia, hyponatremia, hyponatremia 
malnourished these are, these are the structures which all are basic yes sir they will be malnourished they will have hypothyroidism as well so that is something which you have to bear in in this case already had an antidepressant yes sir. that will also have been stopped reversible so cause was present cause. yes sir and this study was published in ajkd which clearly showed that uh, during the correction of hyponatremia we should use hypotonic saline along with desmopressin because it will not it will not cause the rapid correction of the sodium the sodium will be rise in the first 24 hours with 5.8 mg equivalent per liter and in the next 24 hours with only 4.5 mg equivalent per liter so it is always judicious to use hypotonic saline along with the desmoprosin in the correction of the hypo uh, chronic hyponatremia not only the hypotonic saline so the uh, the correct the mistake that has been done was the usage of hypoton uh, three percent hypotonic saline. So this is like you have a horse. You also have got a rein. You are controlling the horse's speed rapidly by using a mineral or a right. Mineral. So there are the uh, hypotonic management guidelines from the American and the European Society. Uh, the American Society says if there are severe symptoms, give an infusion of ten minute of 100, 100 ml three percent. Uh, uh, hypotonic saline bolus, you can repeat it three times if required. While the European society says give only two bolus of 3% uh, hypotonic saline of 150 ml over 20 minutes. They are giving for the longer duration and for the mild to moderate, uh, give 0.5 to 2 ml per kg per hour of 3% uh, saline to correct only 4 to 6 mL equivalent per liter rise in the sodium. That's the biggest message. First big yes, message probably in this case for this situation was asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic. So maybe even milder correction was not required. When we say acute severe hyperlipidemia, we're talking about seizures, we're yes. talking about severe edema, we're talking about impending polio. This patient had nothing. nothing. So probably maximum we could have given something Point like five, 20 huh. over 20 minutes and wait for some time and see from there. Giving 25 ml continuous infusion for 48 hours, 36 yes, hours was clearly something which was not required. While the European society says on the presence of moderate system, only single bolus is sufficient of 150 ml of 3% NS over 20 minutes. And for the higher risk uh, patients, for 2, 6 ml equivalent uh, rise in the sodium should be the daily goal and for the uh, risk, lower risk patients 4 to 8 milligram per liter should be the goal while the european says the correction of 10 milligram per liter on the first day and 18 and 8 milligram per liter daily thereafter so now coming to the reactive strategy when we should go for this strategy when the trajectory of the sodium level is really worrisome when the correction appears to exceed 8 mg per liter 24 hours or 16 mg per liter in the 48 hours. Why does it happen? It is basically due to the water diuresis when the reversible causes like the drugs causing the SIDH, SSRIs, carnosepine, thiazides are removed. Or you are treating the nitroperdol. Uh -huh. We are, the glucocorticoids are given so in the MPDH. I have seen CH over like 196 they become 120 very quickly, but that's acute hyperlipid. Remember that they didn't have any problem. So once you give hydrocord, they can suddenly go up in that class. So case, case also, if we have started indexing hydrocortisone, then also it can rapidly come up. Yes, so we have to be cautious. In the other case, we had given no 3% saline. No, sir. But we had only given hydrocortisone and thyroxine together. Thyroxine deficiency would not have allowed that high level. But if you give both, that would have caused problems. And we decrease the dose of hydrocort also in this patient. Mm -hmm. And what we have to do, we have to give the desmopressin either IV, subcutaneous or orally. And if the sodium level decreases very soon, we can uh, add the slow infusion of 3% saline, 10 to 30 ml per hour. And what we have to do, first give one dose of desmopressin and then see the sodium levels if they are increasing very rapidly or the urine output is increases, then we can we have to give the second dose of desmopressin. It is not 12 hourly or 6 hourly. And we have to monitor the serum sodium 2 to 3 hourly. So here is a, uh, this uh, case report showing the use of desmopressin in lowering the rate of sodium. So if we have a patient here, 
in which we are seeing the rate of correction is going above greater than 16 or greater than 8, we can use the desmopressin. And in this, they have shown that after the use of desmopressin, the sodium, the rate of sodium correction has gone, gone from 0.58 to 0.15 per hour. So this was the, as you said, the trajectory from up is going on the tilt. It has become much more smoother. So I think the principle is that next time you see anybody whose sodium is below 110 or 105, you have to think of adding that no person. I think that's mm -hmm. the big message which is coming. Now coming to the rescue strategy. Okay, you want to call it. Sorry. So the one, one, one of the thing about the desmopressin the is that here uh, when we correct this thing, reversible ADH secretion will be here. Yeah. Uh, okay. So yeah. that the more of water will be, water diuresis will be here. So it add up to the so yeah. 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 So by adding giving the small pressing, they are yeah. closing that time itself. Yes. Then we can try this. Yeah. I think that that's a very important point. Yes. Now coming to the rescue strategy. So as we said, the yes. chronic hyperatremia to be there, you will have an ABP yes. issue. Now once that issue is out, suppose you have given hydrocort, ABP will come now. Yes, sir. So what that will cause again what is that? So that is from outside is that was back to the okay. here. This rescue strategy really rescues the patient from the death, and it is uh, recommended when the sodium rises greater than 18 milliequivalent per hour um, per liter in 48 hours. And where there is already established ODS, the same scenario happens in our patient. And what, what we have to do, we have to stop the water diuresis by the desmopressin, and we have to reload the serum sodium by giving free water. And the same strategy has been followed by us in treating this patient. What we do, we give the 5% free water. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, we give this uh, 6 ml of per kg of IV fluid over two hours. Then uh, we measure the serum sodium every two hourly, and then we uh, decide the next dose of the free water dextrose. We give the desmopressin orally in this patient, 0.1 milligram, uh, 12 hourly, and it is continued even after the, when the dextrose fiber was stopped to prevent the serum sodium from rising again. And here our goal was to, uh, that not to decrease the serum sodium uh, more than 8 milligram per liter in 24 hours. Aim for that, we started at 100. 100. So we could go to around 160. 160. That's part of a goal yeah. and wanted to bring yeah. her back to as close as 160 as possible. Now, what could be the problem of giving dextrose in this scenario? Um, you give it free water, you only. Uh, decrease the sodium. What problem can happen with dextrose in this patient who is having another problem? Another electrolyte problem. Potassium. Oh, insulin. Insulin, right? We we are also supplemented potassium in this patient. And we 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 have also added thiamine to prevent the vernicus encephalopathy because the patient was malnourished, and we also supplemented potassium as sir has already discussed because the infusion of dextrose will trigger insulin and it will cause hypoglycemia. And monitor sodium and potassium two to three hourly and urine output hourly. So uh, we have seen that desmopressin has been uh, used in the proactive strategy, in the uh, reactive strategy, and in the rescue strategy. So in which strategy it works uh, in the maximum capacity? So this is the report clearly showing that if desmopressin is used in the proactive strategy along with the hypotonic saline, it shows there is a low incidence of exceeding serum sodium concentration. And uh, um, it has shown that the rapid correction is uh, very less if we have used this in the proactive strategies. Now coming- What are the usual outcome will they mention about the rescue so, strategy? Uh, How many so, survive? Um, so this was, it was actually- Can talk about that later? Sir, uh, uh, about the desmopressin or there is the overall rescue. So suppose you have established ODS. There is in the next system. So there are some investigation of studies that has been done in the mice. What they have done after the correct rapid correction of the they have uh, uh, after the rapid correction of the hyponatremia, they have infused myoinositol in the mice to prevent the ODS. And what they have 
seen that the after the infusion of myonisetol the red survives so this is the protective uh, effect of the myonisetol just just the experimental therapy and another uh, study have shown that there is some protective effect of dexamethasone on the osmotic induced demyelination in red they have uh, corrected the hyponatremia rapidly by uh, in uh, bolus of hypotonic saline selling yes sir and they have given dexamethasone to one group of mice and not given to another group of mice. And what they have seen, they, uh, the mice with the dexamethasone exhibited minimal neurological impairment. So now coming to the established ODS, uh, we follow rescue therapy uh, for the 48 hours in these patients. And there's really a poor prognosis, but we have to follow this therapy. We aim to reload the serum sodium to a level that is just below the maximum 48 hour target value. That is less than as Sir has discussed. It should be less than 60 milliequin per liter above the initial serum sodium. And the potential efficacy of reloading the sodium after the onset of neurological symptoms of ODS was first demonstrated in the red model. And for the supportive therapy to prevent uh, uh, aspiration pneumonia and respiratory failure, we should uh, surely go for the ventilator support and uh, the plasma pheresis therapies is only the experimental therapies. Now there are some uh, studies on the uh, neurological outcome as you was asking for uh, what happened after the reloading of the serum sodium in the patient after the uh, established ODS. So this was the study in which they have clearly mentioned that the after the neurological status deteriorated after 72 hours, they do rapid reinduction of the hyponatremia and administration of hypertonic cell lines combined with the DDAP. They produce the rapid de uh, prompt decline in the That's serum sodium. Healthy. Yes, sir. And it was well tolerated without any untowards effects, without any neurological circuit. There is a, another case report which clear uh, has the similar lizard which they also use this 5% dextrose along with the desmopressin and they have shown that there was no any neurological sequelae. As you can see, there was no neurological sequelae yeah, after the treatment. The and this is the uh, study that was very similar to our patient. Patient was the case of the MPHD and he was uh, given uh, hormonal replacement. He developed hyponatremia. He had even had quadriparesis. And they, then they reload the sodium after giving the desmopressin and the so, this free per, five percent dextrose, and they what they have observed full neurological recovery after forty eight hours. So, what we have to say there are we should always look for the risk factors. We should take careful history of the drugs. We should go for the minor subtle neurological features like the dysarthria, sleep examination, we should take the history of sleep cycles. And we should always go for the slow correction. We should use desmopressin with 3% hypertonic saline in case of hyponatremia. And when there is established ODS, relower sodium, try to save the patient. We should not lose our hope. Thank you. So I think the big message from all this is that definitely we should go for a proactive and a reactive strategy. And a re But always remember that even if we are rich, we can still rescue it. We saw in our case and so many other cases. So don't lose heart. If you see any first sign, start relovering. Otherwise, we should have given desmopressin right at the beginning. So how do we manage hyponatremia? Look at duration and symptoms. If you have an acute hyponatremia, which is less than 48 hours and symptoms are severe, which basically you have to give uh, and sodium is less than 120, then you can give a bit of 3% saline, correct around 9 to 12. If it's mild to moderate and sodium is 120 to 130, then you rise very small dose of 3% saline. And then rise should not be six, more than 6 to 8. And above 48 hours, or if it is unknown, you assume it to be chronic. In this scenario, if there are severe symptoms, you may give an initial correction, but then don't try to build it up too rapidly. And if it's mild to moderate, definitely no symptoms and no 3% saline is required in that perspective. So probably this patient was here in that regard. So we could have either uh, tried to give one bolus and go from there. If we are giving correction, we should have added desmopressin also in that perspective. 
So as we discussed it, we want the trajectory to be somewhere like this. But if you have a very rapid rise, suppose somebody has given a Vaptin or somebody has given hydrocortisone, somebody has stopped treatment thyroid, suddenly your sodium goes up. Then in that case, altered sensorium, you give DDAVP and free water, that will bring it down to normal. So now again, we have already discussed in this case how there was problems in there. So <clears throat> Dr. Dhwani, you are there? Yes, sir. So what really do you think should have been done here? So, we so while, we, yeah. while we should have uh, given DDAVP along with 3% saline at the very outset itself, yeah. uh, we definitely got late. Um, after starting uh, injection hydrocortisone, she had shown slight improvement initially and then we got this history of uh, altered sleep cycle and dysarthria. So that is when ODS had actually set in in this patient. And we went for the rescue therapy in form of free water and oral desmopressin. But even with this, we were able to achieve a, a 5 milli equivalent per liter per day uh, fall over 48 hours and uh, a clinical resolution in symptoms. So that's the key message that even if you are late, you may get a very good response. So we were able to lower using oral desmopressin and free water. So we gave multiple boluses, Manoj. How many times did we have to give bolus? I think we gave four or five. Uh, five boluses of 5% uh, dextrose and uh, to the ICU team it was looking paradoxical as to what we are doing. Why are we lowering a sodium of 122 but they were not understanding that but finally this patient within a day we were able to get back out of the ICU and latest she came to us she was walking actually. So this is a very very good in which the entire team had to work so hard but it gives a very big messages to everybody. So I think this basically means that when you have somebody with severe hyponatremia if you are thinking of good correction, rapid correction, give DDAVP at that point of time. Second, if your rise, as Vibha was saying, is more than 8 per 24 hours, give DDAVP then. If you have lost all that, even then if you give free water, if you give DDAVP, you will have a good improvement, which is there. So I think this was a big message with that regard. So this was in the background of Sheehan. Now she is on hydrocortisone, thyroxine, and we deferred the induction of thyroxine. And we reduced the dose of hydrocortisone because we knew that if we give too much hydrocort, if we start thyroxine, the patient will have a sudden worsening because sodium will go really high. And gradually the replacement was done in that perspective in that regard. So this was the trend which we saw. And gradually after all that, we were able to establish. So I